You haven't pushed yet. Oh, oh yes, now there you have pushed the button. I pushed the button, and uh, we are live calling Chris Anderson somewhere. Where are you? So, uh, tonight I'm in Paris, actually. So um, oh, I'm gonna I'm, I'm gonna actually get to go home tomorrow, though. So I'm very excited about that. But yes, uh, past few days in Paris with my lovely wife. So that's been really great. Fantastic, and you and just you... sorry. No, no, and I said, and you are. You look like you're someplace I've seen you before. I am in Chicago, back from doing my Revolutionary War Southern Theater tour, The Road to Yorktown, which went really well. So it turned out the right way this time. It did. It did. <laughs> uh, you know, despite the best efforts of of Lord Cornwallis and Bannister Tarleton, it uh, uh -huh. it turned out what I thought was the right way. But perhaps mm -hmm. you would not agree. I do want to welcome everybody to History Happy Hour, brought to you with the help of Stephen Ambrose Historical Tours. Chris and I may travel the globe, but we do try to reserve time every week for a cocktail and a yes. chance to talk to you about history. And today our topic is Nazis in the Cold War, a dark and creepy story perfect for the day before <laughs> Halloween, <laughs> Chris. Right. Um, and Chris, I want you know, we talked about this. A big thank you to everyone supporting this effort via Patreon. And today we, we want to just mention everybody, not just the Absolutely. top shelf sponsors, but everybody who supports us via Patreon. We do, uh, we have 37 people, Chris, all together. So we hugely us, appreciate supporting us on Patreon, and yet still our list is lopsided. It's actually thirty-nine people. Our list is lopsided. We, if we got one more person, we'd have forty. But uh, thank you everybody for supporting us uh, uh, and helping to keep the history taps open via Patreon. And we appreciate every single one of you. Um, who, who, and who's out there, Chris? Looks like we're building a pretty good audience today. We do. Uh, David Picker from Philadelphia. Uh, Doreen, so she's not on stage, so good to see you again, Doreen. Uh, Lynn Kennedy, Shutika. Hey, Shutika. Uh, and uh, Doug McCord. Ah, so, good. Stephen Dean, I see. Liz Mumford, yeah. Frank Cook, uh, Lydia from uh, Washington State. And so, so it's just not all your family, so that's good. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, Gene Templin, I, I spent uh, I spent most of the last week with Chris Templin, so uh, who did a great job on the Revolutionary War tour. So a shout out to him. But Chris, you know, poor, our poor guest is standing by waiting to right. talk. Do you think we've killed enough time yet so we can I, get to him? I think that maybe so. You ready? All right, give me the cue. All right. The bar is open. And uh, today uh, we have uh, a terrific show and topic. Uh, in spite of all the promises after World War II that those high-ranking Nazi war criminals would all be hunted down to the ends of the earth, uh, a bunch of them, including SS officers and some really bad people, ended up working for the U.S. and for its Western allies as uh, spies, uh, covert operators, arms traffickers, uh, of the like. Uh, and uh, we're going to talk about this with uh, a gentleman named Danny Orbach, Dr. Danny Orbach, a history professor and author. And he's written a new book about some of these Nazi mercenaries uh, in the Cold War. And it's called Fugitives. And uh, Danny Orbach is uh, on, he's a historian in Israel, but he's on sabbatical in London. And he joins us here today on History Happy Hour, undoubtedly the top experience of his sabbatical semester. Danny, welcome to History Happy Hour. Thanks for hosting me. Okay, we're delighted to have you. So listen, uh, in your book, it's kind of like you lifted up a rock and there were a lot of really ugly maggots and both cockroaches <laughs> underneath. So what exactly led you to lift up this rock in the first place? Why did you dive into this topic? You know, I must tell you that it was a new experience for me. In my previous books, I dealt with heroes. Sometimes vicious heroes, sometimes tragic heroes. I studied the anti-Nazi underground in the German army, that was a subject of my first book. In my second book, I followed rebellious Japanese officers who might have been cruel, but these were people that you could empathize with. And suddenly, in this book, I had to write about people who were really vicious. And not only vicious, but 
vicious in an unimportant kind of way. You know, you mentioned the, the metaphor of cockroaches, so that was my feeling as well. So the, I, I asked myself kind of once, twice, why is this important? And what my conclusion was, the cockroaches were not so important, but people who encounter cockroaches and start to shout in hysteria and destroying the house while trying to kill the cockroaches, they make a real difference. So what was important was not the Nazi fugitives. It was the hysteria of governments and secret services who did a lot of damage while trying to hunt. Are you there? Okay. Rick, I can't. Okay. Uh, Danny, look, is, is was doing great, and then he's frozen there for a moment. Danny, if you, uh, it looks like you're still there. Danny, can you still hear us? I'm there. Okay. Yeah, I'm good. I can hear you well. Good, excellent. We got. I think we got your whole answer. You just froze up for a minute at the end. Happens once in a while. Mr. Anderson, over to you. Yeah. Well, so Danny, one of the things that I and I love your description of this, uh, as you talk about um, the different routes that some of these people took, um, because it isn't all you know. They don't all take one side or the other. And you you talk about the rubbish heap of ideologies. Uh, and they pick from this rubbish heap. So could you, <laughs> boy, I've never thought I'd ask her this question on History Happier. Can you tell me what sorts of rubbish you're talking about? <laughs> I'll explain this term. You know, Chris and Rick, some readers were quite offended that I used this term too much. I saw it in several reviews of readers. I didn't know why. So I think it's a good opportunity to explain what I meant. So, you know, during the 50s and the 60s, many people were afraid of new Nazis. The Nazi memory was very strong. It was a living memory, the memory of the Second World War. And if you read the press at the time in Europe, even in the United States, many people prophesied that the Fourth Reich is about to come. That it's only a matter of time. In the Israeli press, by the way, this was very common a, a prophecy as well. And one of the things that people tried to bring forth in order to prove it, see how many Nazis integrated in the governments of West Germany, see how many Nazis are in the intelligence services and the army. And what people didn't understand at the time, if that's the point I'm trying to emphasize, is that being a Nazi past 1945 is not the same as being a Nazi during the war. And that has to do with the because the failure of Hitler was so catastrophic, it was so great, that almost nobody, even the most enthusiastic Nazi, even the most hard, even the hardest believer, nobody could claim that everything was okay, that Hitler didn't do any mistakes. And the reality past 1945, the reality of the Cold War, was so different than the reality during the Third Reich, is that no matter how much you wanted, you could not be a Nazi past 1945 as you were during the war. You had to change your ideology because you had to deal with a strategic failure. And usually the people who still wanted to keep some elements of this Nazi rubbish heap, uh, their conclusion was that Hitler's mistake was making an end. Germany could fight maybe the international jewelry. Germany could maybe fight the United States. Germany could maybe fight the Soviet Union. Not all at once. And then what they concluded with new Nazis after the war, that we have to choose the element they like the most from the rubbish from the ruins of Nazi ideology, because we have to pick a side or choose anti-communism and serve the West. Then we have to adopt democracy. So we have to drop aversion to democracy, and we have to drop anti-Semitism, at least as a guiding principle of the state, because it doesn't work well with choosing the American side in the Cold War. You could choose aversion to democracy. Then you serve the Soviet Union, and it means that you drop anti-communism. You can choose anti-Semitism and let's say serve Syria. 
like some of these Nazi criminals did trying to find Israel, but then you have to drop racism, let's say, against people of color who are not Jews. You cannot keep everything at once. Some wanted to kind of more elements of Nazi ideology by being neutral in all world, not picking any side. But then they had to choose a disarmed Germany because a neutral Germany in the context of the early Cold War was disarmed. Then, you know, being disarmed, you give up on Nazi militarism. My point is that all of them had to give up on something. And being a Nazi post-1945 was extremely different than being a Nazi during the war. And I urge our listeners to critically examine every time somebody tells them, oh, X is a fascist. Y is a Nazi contemporary politician. In what way? What does that mean in the context of contemporary politics? It, do it doesn't mean what it meant during the Third Reich. That's one of my main points. So um, one of the things that you write about uh as you write about these these different Nazis uh, uh, from from Germany who are kind of making their choice about whether they're going to try to work with the U.S. or try to work with the Soviet Union or or work with Syria or in some cases perhaps work with Israel, uh, one of the things you write is you say this is a book about illusion, illusions about these uh, Nazi former Nazi mercenaries and illusions by them, illusions that they had. What, what, tell us more about that and what you mean that it's about illusion. I think it's, you divided it in a correct way. It's illusions of Nazis and it's illusions on Nazis. Illusions of Nazis or by Nazis or the illusions that this Nazi fugitive said was of her own importance. They was very important people. When they served the United States, so they were the experts to the Soviet Union, the experts to fighting communism. They believed there would be a linchpin in the Third World War, leading the West to a victory against communism, what they couldn't do uh, last time. Of course, uh, for the West who were merely tools to, you know, complete some gaps of knowledge about the Soviet Union, but they were way less important than they believed. The people who served uh, the Soviet Union tended to think that they were kingmakers, you know, maneuvering between two world empires and cheating them both. It gave the Union's <clears throat> I think we've had a little hiccup West there. West German. Were tools which were used by the Soviet Union and then dropped aside. And the most interesting in this case, I believe, are the Nazis who served in, let's say, the Algerian underground, or forces in the Third World, or Syria. They believe that by bonding with third world countries and with anti-colonial undergrounds, they could establish a new version of Nazi great and so the, the profits from this illegal arms trade to build a Nazi underground or a government in exile or a shadow kind of force, a third force in Europe. Of course, this were less important uh, than they believed, mostly petty mercenaries uh, in all uh, terms. And even the people who served Syria, Alois Bruner, he taught the Syrians some torture techniques, but he was dropped by the Syrians when they didn't need him. So they had illusions of greatness. I think that way more important were the illusions that governments and secret services had about them. Because in the 1950s and the 1960s, the word Nazi was so frightening. You know, you heard Nazi who thought about concentration camps. 
You thought about D-Day. You thought about the grand battles of the last war. You thought about Stalingrad. You thought about something mighty. And when, for example, the French heard that Nazi forces were not being announced and helping the Algerians, for the conclusion was, this is a deadly enemy that we have to fight. When the Israelis heard that Nazi rocket scientists are serving the Egyptians and helping them to develop a program for accurate, precise rockets that can hit anywhere in Israel, so the Israeli conclusion was it's going to be a second Holocaust. The Nazis are trying to exterminate us again, now bonding with the Arabs. And in all cases, these were Asians. The German arms merchants helping the Algerian underground were not that important. The rocket scientists in Egypt were not that important. And the Egyptian project had actually no chance to succeed. And it was not as dangerous to Israel as the Israelis believed. Actually, it was not dangerous at all. But what mattered? The response. Because when the French wanted to stop the Nazi arms merchants, they launched a campaign of assassinations against the Germans, as I describe in the book. And this campaign of assassinations, A, a soared the relationship between, between West Germany and France exactly when the countries, these two countries, needed one another the most. And also, it uh, paved the way for over the Chinese, red Chinese and Soviet involvement in the arms trades to the Middle East. So the French, instead of kind of following these German arms merchants, maybe sabotaging their shipments, Israel is the same, opening a campaign, launching a campaign of assassinations, and damaging the relationship between Israel and West Germany, creating a huge political crisis inside Israel. So the response was destructive more than the activity of the Nazi fugitives. That's my point. So, so kind of picking up on that, Danny, one of the, let's, I just want, let's use this one character as an example. Um, you, you talk quite a bit about Galen and, and the important part he plays in setting up this operation. Um, and he's a character that's actually come up in other books that we've had uh, authors discussing in, in, in terms of intelligence. Could you tell us a little bit about Galen uh, and, and how he becomes so important to the West and, and use him as an example? Well, maybe. Galen, yeah, well, Chris, so Reinhold Galen was a fascinating figure. So in, he was not a spy master as it is described in some books. He was an intelligence analyst. His intelligence service called the Fremde Ereos, Foreign Armies East, was an office responsible for analysis of intelligence from the Eastern Front. He had uh, some people under him were collecting intelligence as well, but mostly intelligence analysis. And he understood, like many others, he was not the only one, in kind of 43, the Germany is going to lose the war. And he thought about his own future. He didn't want to join the anti-Nazi underground, that was too dangerous, and it was not his character to take such risks. And what he did was that in 1945, he just he picked up the archive, the secret intelligence archive he had in the Soviet Union, he packed it in water-resistant crates, and buried it deep in the Bavarian Alps. Because he knew he, that the Soviet Union and the United States would start to, at least that the relationship we saw after the war, maybe it will lead to a third world war, maybe not. But what he was certain about was that the Americans will need intelligence of the Soviets, and they didn't have enough intelligence. We should emphasize to our listeners that during World War II, American intelligence organizations were forbidden by a presidential decree to collect intelligence on the Soviet Union. So, because the Soviet Union was an ally. And we had almost known. And Gellin knew we would need his secret archive. And the funny thing, 
it actually worked. Not immediately. The Americans didn't recognize Galen's importance right away. But once the news about his appearance kind of rolled down the line and up the hierarchy, U.S. officers from G2, military intelligence, received a treasure trove of intelligence, and they took Galen as a kind of mercenary of the United States. He was one of the first intelligence entrepreneurs to appear after the war and kind of establishing an intelligence record serving the American army. Um, he was never that talented. He was never that good. The intelligence organization he established was mediocre, to say the least. The thing is that Gellin was very skilled politically to display himself, to portray himself to the Americans as the only one available. He was very skilled in like pushing rivals aside and very skilled in the power game of intelligence organizations. So the Americans almost always knew his mediocre. If you read the CIA reports, the CIA always complained about him. But then they said, first, he's the only guy we have. Why? Because the Americans helped him to eliminate his rivals before him. Uh, and then we invested so much in him. A little break up again. Sorry about that. Failure of human beings. So and I'll repeat myself. Sunken thank you, costs. Thank you. you know, we we dropped. You know, we invested so much in him. We cannot really drop him. And uh, finally, when he eliminated his rivals and became virtually the only intelligent professional left in West Germany. Everybody knew he's going to be the West German spy chief. And for the Americans, it was very convenient to have their own man installed as the head of a foreign agency. So he was never the best, but he was a good politician. And he kind of rolled on to be a leader of a spy agency because of his political talent, not because of his intelligence talent. So, so uh, I, I'm going to ask now, and, and the question uh, can apply to Reinhard Galen or some of the other cockroaches <laughs> that you yeah. uncovered, which is, did at any point, did the um, leadership in the United States, whether it's, you know, Alan Dulles or someone at the CIA or someone in the Army, say, uh, you know, maybe we don't want to have this Nazi or these Nazis uh, working for us. Maybe we've just been fighting them for five years and probably isn't it really a good idea to suddenly rely on them as our best friends. Did that, did that ever occur to anybody? I quote Ellen Dallas in the book. He said very famously about Galen specifically. I don't know if he's a rascal. There are few archbishops in espionage. There are few archbishops in espionage. Archbishops in espionage. Yes, he's right. on our side and that all the traitors. By right. the way, this is very anachronistic today. No one will use archbishops as a symbol of righteousness. <laughs> <laughs> right. That is a that's that's coming. But that's so so he's a uh, he he might be a rat, but he's our rat. Is the uh, is another way you you might that's say really it. A, to correct a kind of common mistake. Uh, books which were published on, you know, there is this anti-CIA genre, genre of writing in the United States. The latest Go book figure. was Legacy of Ashes. And uh, this book that usually come from the more, let's say, liberal or leftist side of the political spectrum, tend to be very critical of the CIA, usually exaggerate about CIA employment of Nazis. Yes, the CIA employed Nazis. We know about at least 30 people, but there may be more. 30. It's CIA and uh, the counterintelligence group, CIC, together. By the way, it depends on your definition of a Nazi. Here it's a minimal definition of people who are really war criminals, not any German officer. But the CIA, and I saw it in the documents, especially in the earliest, they didn't like the idea of Nazis. 
They were not cool about it. They were not indifferent to Nazi crimes. That's why there were many people they didn't do that. But when they felt it was necessary, they ignored criminal records completely. So they employed relatively few people, but some of these people were really vile criminals. And everybody who criticized the CIA for employing Nazis, the British, the French, the Soviets, the West Germans, employed Nazis themselves when they saw fit. So as I write in the book, in the Cold War, one man's moral sin was another man's necessity. Huh. So you could always say, I just have to, I don't want to employ these cockroaches, but maybe there is going to be a new war. So I cannot give up on this intelligence. I have to tell you something really, really kind of, that will maybe amaze our listeners about how American bureaucracy kind of self excused itself. Um, there was a war criminal named Klaus Barbie, a very famous one. He was the uh, a Gestapo chief in Lyon, in France, known as the Butcher of Lyon. And he was employed by the uh, CIC, if I remember well. When the French asked for his extradition, the CIC were ordered by the US government to stop employing him. And then the CIC told, reported the following. We are going to stop employing this criminal starting from now. But he shouldn't know that he's not employed, right? Because then he may escape. So to keep him ignorant that we fired him, we are going to give him intelligence tasks and give him money and collect information <laughs> for him. So the CIC employed Barbie so he wouldn't know that he's actually unemployed. So this is my favorite anecdote about the US employing Nazis in the Cold War. And the, I, could the, use a, I could use a job like that. Yeah, yeah, the, the, <laughs> the, the, CIC, the CIC, I think that may have happened to me. I, I got fired, but I didn't know it because they kept paying me and I kept working. And the CIC was the Army Intelligence Agency. Is that correct? Counterintelligence Agency. Yeah, counter, yeah co CIC, yeah. counterintelligence. Uh, yeah. Um, just to clarify for people. Counterintelligence Corps. The G2 was the positive intelligence uh, agency of the Army. Chris, I'll stop talking. You can ask uh, a question. Well, well I, we're kind of picking up on what we've been talking about, and it is funny, but it's also a little scary. Um, given the that everybody eventually uses some Nazis and in their intelligence, the, the people that you describe in this book, these cockroaches, as you say so aptly, the, they're not exactly the brightest bulbs in the box. And so how is it that, uh, well, first of all, how was it that we're able to that we hire these guys? But did, did you ever come across any accounts of them actually being valuable or very early? Right. So, okay. was valuable, but especially the tactical intelligence he gave was sometimes useful. I, right. I said he was mediocre. You know, he was not trashy. Right. But some of the other people, especially the independent mercenaries or intelligence and North and this were completely useless, like Wilhelm Kotel. And when you ask why they were hired, the answer is very interesting. It has to do with two drawbacks of the American intelligence community. One, which still exists today, unfortunately, is ignorance of languages. Yeah. Too few people in the American intelligence community knew German. And as a speaker of German, I discovered mistakes in the CIA documents which were almost comical. Um, I didn't believe I saw it. You know, uh, somebody in a letter wrote that his friend is going to return from Doha, Doha, the city in Qatar. Mm -hmm. And then the CIA analyst writes in a note, with it, from Doha in German would be von Doha. And then the CIA analyst writes, we don't know a Nazi named Doha, but we are still <laughs> looking for him. <laughs> and uh, the second thing was that there were too many American intelligence organizations and they were not uh, fond of sharing information with one another. Right. So you could easily fool American intelligence analysts who didn't really know Central Europe and were ignorant about the languages. 
and you could fool them even more because when somebody dropped you, you could always go to another agency. And some of these intelligence entrepreneurs kind of played between, of course, in the end, they stayed in the call because <laughs> there is a kind of a limited amount of time that you can fool virtually everybody. But they made right. good money for quite a few years. I was going to say, they made to string that one out for quite a while. Yeah, it's kind of, we since we were talking about archbishops, it's kind of like people being transferred from one diocese to the other uh, when there's a little bit of wrongdoing uh, of one kind or another. Don't want to push that metaphor too far. No. One of the most head-shaking things in your book, uh, Danny, is that Israel was not adverse to working with former Nazis. Uh, including uh, one guy who was one of Hitler's favorites and probably very familiar to a lot of people in our audience, uh, Otto Skorzeny, if I'm saying yes. his name correctly, um, uh, who uh, famously led the raid to rescue Mussolini and, and, uh, and was involved in the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, tell us a little bit of what you've learned about <coughs> Israel's involvement with some of these uh, former Nazi mercenaries. First of all, let me tell that Otto Skorzeny was not the vilest criminal that Israel employed. Israel employed in, in 1950 Walter Rauf, who, unlike Skorzeny, was a Holocaust perpetrator, a major Holocaust perpetrator. He was responsible for an extermination method called the gas vans, and really responsible for mass extermination of Jews. It was not clear whether his employer, his employer was not in the Mossad, Mossad did not exist in 1950. It was Mamad, one of the predecessors of the Mossad, uh, employed him. He wasn't, Ralph was thrown out of Syria, was an advisor in Syria for a few years, and he gave Israel information about Syria. He told his Mamad handler that he was responsible only for forging coins. And what this Mamad Endler, who later became very famous in Israel, he was one of the architects of the Israeli nuclear program later. A Dr. Fryer, that was his name, the name of the Israeli Endler, said, I, I was glad that he was not involved in extermination of Jews. I didn't want to ask too much. You know, he didn't really know that Ralph was a major Holocaust perpetrator, but he didn't try too hard to find out what Ralph exactly did. In later years, by the way, the Mozart tried to kill Ralph after the full extent of his crimes became known, but it was, let's say, a very unenthusiastic assassination attempt. <laughs> enthusiastic assassination. And they right. saw the, the, the assassination team um, alerted uh, Ralph's wife. Uh, they shouldn't have done it. They did kind of too much noise. And when she started to shout, they said, oh, we are not allowed to kill other people. And she will call the police. So maybe, maybe that's okay. I think unenthusiastic assassination is a, is a new phrase in my... <laughs> I'm going to have to use that. <laughs> I, I definitely want to be using it uh, again. And, and they also... Uh, but uh, they also employed or con considered employing at least uh, a, a person you also talk about in your book who seems like a, a, a lovely a lovely chap, so to speak. Uh, uh, this fellow, Alice uh, Bruner. No, the uh, Mossad never, never considered him from Bruner. They tried to kill him actually twice. Okay. So I thought there was also a time where someone was talking to him and they were they were it looking for information Ralph. from him. It was Ralph. Oh, it's Ralph. Okay. No problem. Brunner for the Mossad was only a target. Uh, they tried to kill him twice. Brunner, by the way, was so anti-Semitic. He picked anti-Semitism for Hitler's rubbish. And just to tell our audience who this chap was, he was I Adolf Eichmann number two. Adolf Eichmann was the kind of technician of the Holocaust. So Bruno was a troubleshooter for extermination of Jews. Whenever extermination was not fast enough, he went through and solved problems. He was responsible again for mass extermination. Oh, sorry. And he served the Syrian regime as an advisor. So he was in Syria since 1954 or 55. It's not completely clear. And since 1960, around 1960, he started to serve Syrian intelligence as an advisor. 
did Mossad try to kill him twice? First attempt was in 1961, second attempt was in 1980. And in both cases, it was through a parcel box. And so, you know, we never considered employing him, nothing. The okay. Mossad was not that unscrupulous. Even when we employed Otto Skolzeni, who you mentioned before, uh, they kind of tried to make sure that he was not involved in the Kristallnacht, which he probably was, but they kind of convinced themselves that he wasn't, but he was certainly not involved in exterminations. Maybe in burning two synagogues in Vienna in 1938, but that was not completely clear. But let's say a few words about why he was because Scorzani was not recruited by the Mossad as a regular agent. He was uh, recruited for his connections. So back then, the Mossad tried to fight the German rocket program. We are in, in Egypt, the German scientists who helped the Egyptians develop the rocket program. We are now in 1964. The Mossad knows very well that the program is not really dangerous anymore. You know, the panic that was in 62 when they tried to assassinate these German scientists, it was long gone. But it created a political crisis between Israel and West Germany, and a political crisis inside Israel. Israeli public opinion depend, you know, demanded that somebody will do something to throw these people out of Egypt. And the government couldn't ignore that. And the Mossad was looking for ways to penetrate the program again. There was a security officer in the program, an SS sergeant called Hermann Valentin, which was very good in thwarting most of the attempts to penetrate the program. And they knew they had to neutralize this Valentin somehow. And then Rafi Eitan, was back then the Mossad's legendary spy chief in Europe, discovered that this Korzeni was Valentin's commander during the war. So the Mossad came up with the idea, let's recruit Herman Valentin through Skorzeny. So Skorzeny's role was to give the Mossad access to the security officer of the rocket program in Egypt. And the way they recruited Skorzeny, they did it through his wife. A, a very charming Mossad agent, and a quoting from this is not politically correct in today's parlance, most of documents from the 60s, we sent an agent, they wrote, who had a strong influence on women in a certain age. Okay. And, and he was able to kind of flirt with Scorzeni's wife. He had an affair with her. She and Scorzeni had an open relationship. <clears throat> and she was so charmed by him that she introduced him to her husband. And Scorzani knew right away that he's speaking with Mossad agents, and he was very curious. He was very fascinated to see armed Jews. You know, Jews who can fight, Jews who are masculine, or kind of macho types. He was not used to think about Jews like that. And the Mossad agent that recruited Scorteni was wise enough to treat him as a colleague and always kind of aroused his curiosity. But Scorteni had a few requests from Israel. He asked for a letter of immunity from Levi Eshkol, who was Israel's prime minister. That was a discovery of my colleague, Ronan Bergman. Uh, and there was a huge debate in Israel whether to give him this letter or not. In the end, they gave it to him. And some other petty requests. But not with curiosity. And by the way, in the world of intelligence, many agents are recruited like that. He loved the conversations with, with his most of enders. We see documents which are kind of so funny when you read them from the perspective of today. We spoke, writes the Mossad Hender. We spoke about world affairs, including apartheid South Africa, 
and he shocked me with his deeply racist views. Why do you speak with a Nazi? What do you expect? <laughs> 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 so he collaborated with the most of them till he died in 1975. Wow. So, so Danny, I mean, I mean, not to make not to make all Western intelligence agencies look completely incompetent, which through your book they kind of do. Um, we'll, we'll broaden our scope a bit here. Um, can you tell us a little bit about um, Otraco? What was it, and, and was Otraco. it any more effective? Otraco is a, an acronym for Orient Trading Company. This was a scheme of neo-Nazi arms merchants to, first of all, to make money, to sell arms uh, to the Third World. The arms almost exclusively came from the Soviet bloc. Uh, remember, after the Second World War, there were many, many arms to spare. You know, there was a huge excess of weapons and somebody wants to sell them to make money. And many of his weapons were Germans, other were Czech, actually, made in Czechoslovakia. And Otrako sent them to various countries in the First World, but the Third World, but their most important destination was Algeria. And they wanted to help the Algerians fight the French, also to make money, but also out of the kind of leftover Nazi ideological scheme of an alliance between Germany and the Third World against the capitalist powers, the democratic capitalist powers, especially France, which are hated. I must say that the war between France and Algeria, the Algerian War of Independence, had torn the neo-Nazi community apart. Many new Nazis volunteered to serve France in the foreign legion because they were what they called traditional racists. They wanted to fight the war of the white race in Algeria, as we saw it. But other Nazis held opposite views. They didn't care about this kind of racism anymore, but they did care about fighting the West. Which is another element of Nazi. Ideology. So this goes back to which which thing you're picking up off the rubbish heap. Exactly. And Otraco was a scheme. It was, you know, shared by arms merchants in Germany. Most important of which was a new, two neo Nazi leaders called Ernst Wilhelm Springer and Otto Ernst Remer. And they collaborated with Nazis in the Middle East, including this exterminator of Jews, Alois Brunner, who was hiding in Syria. And he was part of his Otraco scheme as well. And uh, the French, who were really afraid of the influence of Otraco, tried to assassinate members of his network. In the end, they were able to kick these German arms merchants out, but they received again the Red Chinese and the Soviets instead. A at the same time, Reinhard Gehren was the spy chief of West Germany, try to recruit some members in Otrako in order to use them as agents of influence in the Middle East. And by doing that, Okay. Usually if I say something, he'll come back on. <laughs> Danny, we've lost you for a moment. Okay. Danny, we lost you for a moment, but you were just saying that uh, Galen tried to to recruit uh, uh, Otraco uh, as agents uh, of influence. Exactly, in the Middle East. And by doing that, Galen undermined his own government's policy. Because West German policy at the time was the approach to France. The alliance between France and West Germany was the bedrock of Chancellor Adenauer's Cold War policy. We really know that the spy chief behind his back was helping the Algerian underground by supporting the truck. So this is again in France and in West Germany a story of secret services which are doing harm to the government's policies by overreacting to the presence of Nazis in this case. The French by this wild campaign of assassinations, the Germans fight by trying to recruit them. 
We do we do apologize for the audio problems here tonight. Um, doing the best we can. Uh, are, are you, you're back with us, Danny. Yes, I'm back with you. Yes, yeah, sorry. I don't. I don't. Uh, I, I I didn't make the internet. I can't fix it. Um, but uh, uh, you were saying that they they shot themselves in the foot. The different countries, by the way, they responded to to these Nazis. Um, which is really one of the big themes of your book uh, that that uh, as you say uh, in the beginning it's not so much uh, what these f folks did as the way governments responded to what they did I, I want to ask you Danny about about researching this book because you know it strikes me as a pretty hard book to write given that you're talking about intelligence agencies of various countries who I I cannot believe we're, we're like all super willing to open every uh, file to you and uh, also who might be somewhat reluctant to admit that their hands were were dirty with this 50 or 60 years ago. Well, I could speak in an, an entire hour about it. It's, by reaching there, actually doing the research was the most fun part in writing this book. It, what really helped me was a law from the Clinton administration, I believe, uh, that the CIA had to expose all intercourse with Germans before 1945, who were active before 1945, of course, with many exceptions. But in principle, the CIA had to expose the documents, and they did so. The West German intelligence agency, uh, uh, BND, were afraid that the CIA will expose their documents as well. So they started an exposure program of their own. They did it very late, but I, when I started, when I began to write this book, the BND opened much of its records as well. The BND now, is, is the, uh, uh, the German. West German, now German. Is yeah. so right. This was the Galen, what Galen is starting. A success of the Galen organization. The French were completely closed. I was able to discover very little. I, I heard if we are going to make in the next year or so, uh, if so, there may be interesting news. Um, then foreign ministries, justice ministries, uh, internal security services were way, way easier to approach. But the most fun story I have is about uh, the getting the most documents. I tried to use those sort of connections, and nothing worked. And in the end, I did it in the most boring way. I sent a letter to the spokesperson unit of the prime minister's office. And it worked. <laughs> like, after one year and a half, my wife calls me urgently. You have a very thick envelope, she told me, from the Prime Minister's office, which was stuck in our mail about to fall down to the cats below. And these were the documents I needed, and I never believed that when the Secret Service does send documents for you, it will be sent in such a way. But that's how it happened. Wow. What we really lack are documents from Arab secret services, or we have nothing. And then I have to tell something about my own laziness. What you have here in Britain, specifically in Cambridge, and actually 500 meters from a current apartment, there is a college called Churchill College. In Churchill College, they have a, the Mitrochin collection. Vasily Mitrokhin was a deserter from the KGB who brought a lot of documents to Britain. And when I inquired in the beginning, they were, they, they were ready to give me all relevant documents of the Middle East to send me scans. But they had to, I had to pay 50 pounds and I was lazy and I was stingy. And then I said, you know, ah, the, my research is really in initial stages. When I need it, I'll get it. Oh, it's okay to wait one year, two years, nothing will happen. But then they sharpened the security procedures. And they couldn't access these documents any longer. So all of us who listen to us, don't be lazy. 
Okay. To learn a lesson. Don't be lazy. Get the documents now and worry about the 50 pounds later. <laughs> so, so, Dave, so uh, I'd like to think that there was a moment when all of um, these intelligence agencies kind of came to their senses and, and pulled the plug on all this. But, but how or when or why did people finally come to their senses and go, these people are a bunch of chumps? <laughs> People virtually lost interest. I think it was more, you know, the famous saying by General MacArthur, all, sol all soldiers don't die, they just fade away. Right. I think that interest faded away in the mid 60s. Right. So the Americans knew enough about the Soviets now, we didn't need, especially there was when Sigmund was raised in importance in the late 50s. In the early 60s, you don't need this kind of dubious human or human sources or German spies any longer. Eh, the French left Algeria. Otraco was no more, you know, because it lost it. It was actually scattered to the four winds. I tell the story why they kind of fought with one another and it was kind of destroyed by the French assassinations. The Gehlen organization was purged of Nazis in the early 60s because of the Felfe spy scandal when we discovered that some of his Nazis uh, were Moors. The Israelis lost interest as well. After the rocket, this kind of crisis of the rocket program, everybody was tired, nobody wanted another Eichmann trial, nobody cared about uh, Nazi hunting anymore. I like to tell a story that in the 70s there was still a department in the Mossad hunting Nazis. And the department responsible for agent handling in Europe um, found a piece of intelligence about Alois Brunner coming to Europe. It was untrue, by the way. And according to procedure, they should have gave it to the department responsible for Nazi hunting. And it took them three months to do so. <laughs> when the two departments were in the same corridor, the distance <laughs> was 100 years. You know, sending a letter, taking three months where you are 100 meters apart, that's certainly an achievement of the Mossad that <laughs> you didn't see in other intelligence agencies. Uh, so everybody lost interest, and even in the, uh, even the Syrians, by the way, kind of tossed aside Alois Brunner when we learned enough of him. And these Nazi adventures were also very unreliable. So the last time the Otraco guys really fooled the Syrians was when the two leaders of Otraco were able to sell the Syria, Syria the idea that they may help them to develop a rocket program, like Egypt did. <laughs> so the Egyptian program was completely trashy, but it was a program. Uh -huh. The leader of Sofotraco didn't know anything about rockets. They just took money from the Syrians. And after a few months, the Syrians discovered it and told them you had 24 hours to leave the country and they never returned. So everybody got tired. It just faded away. Right. What, what, and one of the things that, that is important to say here, uh, we're using, an, a, 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 a viewer asked about it, we're using the word Nazi, and, and obviously there were a lot of people in Germany who were in the Nazi party who weren't uh, high-ranking Nazis, but many of the people we're talking about are folks who were in the SS, people who were yeah. uh, part of the uh, the army, people who were connected with, like Skorzeny, who were connected with Hitler. These are not run-of-the-mill, low-level uh, German uh, citizens who just got caught up in Nazism. These were people who were, in many cases, pretty enthusiastic adherents of uh, of the Nazi party and, and what Hitler was trying to do and of his own intelligence organization. So, right? I mean, I, that's, that's at least my impression from the book. That was actually one of the most difficult things for me to define what a Nazi is. And we spoke about the rubbish heap before. Even people who defined themselves as Nazis after the war were not Nazis in the wartime sense. Nobody could be a Nazi in the wartime sense. But if you really want to be... Wait for it. Nazi, Wait for it. Nazi years before 1945, then these are most Germans, unfortunately. If it's only certified war criminals, 
then it's a much smaller group. If it's everybody who served in, let's say, explicitly criminal organizations, like the SS, the Gestapo, the Reich Main Security Office, then it's a bigger group. But then, but what about the army? No, not every soldier was a war criminal, but we know today that the Wehrmacht, the German army, was responsible for many war crimes. Uh, may, or maybe a Nazi is somebody who defines himself as a Nazi after 1945. Again, then we, it's a much smaller group of people. It's very, very, very uh, problematic and and evidence for that is that the scientists who worked in Egypt for the rocket program, as far as I know, very few of them define themselves as Nazis or even cared about Nazi ideas. After 1945, they just wanted to make money. But in Israel, the world defined automatically as Nazis. Because these are Germans who are against us, so they must be Nazis. Mm. Well, on that note, uh, Danny Orbach, we will want to say thank you so much for joining us today on History Happy Hour from uh, from Cambridge uh, and talking about your book, your fascinating book, Fugitives, A History of Nazi Mercenaries During the Cold War. And thank you for turning that rock over and looking underneath because it certainly led to some interesting things. And thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for hosting me. Thank you, Danny. And, and guys, read the book. Um... You'll be shocked, horrified, amused, befuddled, bewildered. It's all of it. <laughs> it's all there. It's all there. Uh, so we'll say goodbye, Danny. We'll say goodbye to you later off the air. Thank you so much for joining uh, thank us. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, uh, yeah. Wow. Nazis <laughs> and and what is a def defining a Nazi? Which it really is a good question, right? When you know we throw that word around, what does it mean? Um, Chris, next week we had a live episode planned, but scheduling got in the way, so we have uh, we have forced to postpone. And next week mm -hmm. we are going to have on um, a, um, a rerun, a, an encore episode with uh, Lynn Olson talking about Marie Madeline. One Foucault. of our favorites. Really a great show. It's, it's almost two years since we had this show on the air, and mm -hmm. uh, we've never run it again, so I think that that's one that people will enjoy. But then we'll be back live, uh, and uh, I'll spring this on you uh, right. to tell you tell us about the topic, but it's a place that you've been. Um, yes, many times. One uh, of my favorite times. places. Yeah, so what's this about? Uh, it's about uh, the, the Second Ranger Battalion at a place called Hill 400, and um, what's really fascinating is uh, Len Lamell, who was one of the central figures of the Second Ranger Battalion, famous for what he did at Point Du Hoc uh, on D-Day. I knew Len very well, and he always told me that uh, if you asked him what his longest day was, it was the Battle on Hill 400. He said D-Day was easy compared to Hill 400. So uh, this new book is just about that fight uh, at Hill 400, and, and it's, it's fascinating. So we're looking forward to those uh, two upcoming shows. And a reminder that all of our programs are archived on YouTube and that you can listen to episodes now on the History Happy Hour podcast. I know. So when you're stuck in traffic. I know. Available on uh, in various places that podcasts are available. Archi uh, Apple, um, uh, Spotify, I don't even know. Stitcher, Pocket Cast. We're trying to get on the Google podcast. Things but I haven't even heard of. It's out there. You can listen now. You don't, you know, you can put it in your car. You can listen to episodes over and over again. It's so exciting. <laughs> and and people are already listening to the podcast, Chris. So that's, yeah, that's exciting really cool. as well. So so we're podcasters now. Wow. So soon, soon maybe we can be influencers. Ooh. I don't think we're going to influence anybody. <laughs> okay. That's anyway. that really scary visual there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, really. Listen, keep learning and keep living. Keep living and keep learning, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Be safe, everybody.